So welcome to Crisis Text Line, Emergency Mental Health Care in Turbulent Times, brought to you by NAMI Cook County North Suburban. We're glad you chose to spend some time with us tonight and know that you'll find the program interesting and also very practical. I'm Dr. Christine Somerville. I'm a mental health educator and director of programs at NAMI Cook County North Suburban. For those of you who don't know about NAMI, we are the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization providing public awareness, no cost support and education programs online and in person so that people and their families affected by mental health conditions can build better lives. We are a lifeline to individuals and families who don't know what to expect in their difficult life journey. Our programs are free and open to those in our 17 community service area, but we don't turn anyone away who's in need. In a real mental health crisis, many people simply do not know what to do or where to go. Painful moments can cripple families in, cri in critical times. So tonight's presentation is an inside look into the crisis text line. Our guest presenter for tonight will share his insights as a volunteer crisis counselor for the past year. He'll navigate through his experiences on the platform and its place in the mental health care universe. So we will leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Please feel free to type any of your questions or comments in the chat box at any time during the presentation. And if we have time to address them as we go, we will. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Chris Gillick has been a NAMI Family Support Group facilit Facilitator for over seven years, maybe even longer than that. Um, his Saturday support group is one of our most popular and well-attended groups. It normally meets at St. Francis Hospital, but since the pandemic began, it now meets online via Zoom. Chris is a member of the NAMI CCNS board and is a volunteer crisis counselor for the crisis text line. So it is my great pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Mr. Chris Gillick. Thank you, Christine. And hello, everybody. Um, I see in the chat that uh, there's a couple of, uh, or at least one fellow crisis counselor, crisis text line counselor on uh, the call. And that's great. Good to see you, All right, except I can't see you. But um, uh, you, can, you can fact check me and, and that's a good thing. So uh, that'll be fun. Um, right, I'm gonna be talking about the crisis text line. Many of, many of you have already heard of it. Um, I became aware of it, uh, I guess I was vaguely aware of it a couple of years ago, but became acutely aware of it uh, right around the beginning of the uh, pandemic. And I'm going to uh, uh, share a screen. I have a few slides. I'm Yeah, there's considerably more than 5,000 conversations a day. This video was done in 2019. So. Okay. So to get into the crisis text line, you, you dial uh, you punch 741741 into your phone. And if you have a, 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 a keypad of your phone handy, you'll notice something interesting. Uh, that uh, 741, I'll see if I can do this here. Yeah, the keypad on your phone, if you go up 
the left-hand column of numbers above the asterisk is 741. You go up that twice, 741, 741, and you're into the crisis text line. And uh, that was done deliberately so people can actually uh, access the crisis text line quickly and even in the dark if they need to. Um, so the crisis text line is uh, addressing a huge need uh, here in the United States and in, in uh, the UK, Ireland, and Canada, and we're about to launch in Australia too. And uh, hang on a second here. Yeah, uh, uh, what's that? What's the what's the need? Well, we've got 65 million of our fellow Americans suffering from some sort of mental illness each year. Uh, a lot of people are undiagnosed. A lot of people have no treatment. A lot of people are suffering in silence. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, uh, a, a crisis uh, of epic proportions nationwide. The crisis text line is absolutely free and it's available all the time. Uh, it is an always on kind of situation, 24 seven, 365. You hit that, uh, those six text numbers and you're in. The goal is to serve every texter within five minutes. Uh, when things get busy, there is a queue, but the way that queue is managed is quite different than uh, other crisis services. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in the presentation. The crisis counselors have a considerable amount of training to get uh, accepted as a volunteer. And it's all focused on taking people from their crisis moment, their hot moment, if you will, to a calmer point uh, and a calmer place in their, in their hearts and minds. So, so they can start making plans and uh, uh, coming up with some steps to get the assistance that they need. And once again, this service is available to anybody who can uh, text 741741. And that's uh, most, most everybody. Um, why text? Um, this is a question that doesn't really need to be uh, asked anymore, I don't think. But uh, if you have any young people in your life, anybody say under the age of 35, you might notice that they prefer texting to other modes of, of communication. Uh, I have a couple of 20 somethings and you know they'll text me from the next room instead of coming in and talking to me. So that, that's very common. And uh, it, it is even more extreme as you get to younger people. Also, I've had situations with my own loved ones with mental illnesses when they're in, uh, having meltdowns or, or borderline psychosis, and they're, they're too uh, uh, symptomatic to talk. They, they can't function, can't speak, but they can still text. So we get a lot of that on the text line as well. Texting is a great way to get specific information, concise information communicated. I, I think it uh, might be the best way. Uh, most importantly, texting is e extremely discreet and can be used um, when telephone calls simply can't be used. Uh, I've had uh, teenagers text me from the back seat of the car as their parents are driving. I've had uh, uh, people that are experiencing physical abuse text me while their abuser is in the room. Students are texting between classes. Uh, executives are texting between meetings. Um, it's, it's something that's very handy and uh, it, it can't be overheard. So that's very important. And another piece of it is uh, texting is a mode of communication that pretty much eliminates the whole implicit bias issue. If you sit with somebody, you see them and you're gonna form some judgment, you can't help it. You're gonna form some kind of judgment based on what you see. And if you talk to them on the phone, you're gonna form some sort of judgment based on what you hear. Uh, you don't see anybody, you don't hear anybody when you're texting. And uh, so you're less likely to have any judgment triggered. And by the way, that, that's a two-way street. It not only works for the uh, crisis counselors, but it works for the textures. They're less likely to form a judgment of you um, based on your appearance or your voice. Um, so that's why texting, I think, is a, is a pretty, pretty much a perfect way of getting in touch with a lot of people in the in the in the in the current world. 
here's a little snapshot, a couple, a few boxes on the, on the text line. As I mentioned, it's uh, text line is multinational now. Um, it's available um, uh, in several countries, uh, US, Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Uh, Australia is about to launch. Also, uh, we're getting ready here in the United States to launch a Spanish language service, which is very much needed. And once that's up and running, once it's staffed, uh, I would expect to see some Latin American countries uh, coming into the platform as well. Um, everything is uh, confidential and it's, uh, it happens strictly through text messaging, SMS messages. The service is totally confidential and, and anonymous. That's key uh, in order to create safety for folks to share things that they might not share. Otherwise, uh, you have to keep this pretty much uh, uh, sealed. Uh, stuff that's on this platform can't be getting out. Um, the, the concept here is strangers helping strangers. They don't know who I am. I don't know who they are. And, uh, and somehow that alone tends to make people feel better in a strange way. Uh, the idea that someone that you've never heard of is sitting at their laptop at two in the morning and waiting for you to come in with your issue. That's very uh, hopeful for a lot of people. Uh, the crisis text line is an open platform. All mental health issues are, are addressed. It's not just a suicide hotline or something like that. Um, we also get all sorts of different crises that are not directly related to mental health. We have folks that are in physical health uh, crises of various kinds. We've got people that are struggling with uh, poverty, that are struggling with homelessness all sorts of things that may or may not be directly related to mental health. And we try to help all those folks as well. And here's the interesting, here's the special sauce of the crisis text line. Uh, there's a lot of technology to this, this uh, organization and uh, there's an, a massive amount of data, um, something like 200 million conversations have occurred on the platform and each conversation is about 40 messages long, right? Um, or no, I'm sorry, 200 million messages is what I should have said in about 6 million conversations. So uh, every message has a bunch of words in it. There, it all that data is gathered and it's, uh, they, they do that, uh, you know, um, data mining kind of uh, activity to figure out what words indicate what mental health issues. And then they use that to establish triage uh, stuff. And it's kind of funny because, you know, you would expect if somebody is using the word suicide, that means that they're um, at great risk of suicide. But there's other words that are much more uh, indicative of uh, suicide ideation and possible uh, uh, execution of a suicide plan. The words like Tylenol or bridge in other words that may not immediately come to line. So essentially the technology is a form of triage. It brings the high risk people to the front of the line. And while we sometimes get a, uh, a waiting period at the crisis text line during uh, peak uh, times, the folks at high risk almost always get uh, serviced within five minutes of their first text. So you can think of it as an online mental health emergency room. Just like an emergency room, if you have a sprained ankle and somebody comes in with a gunshot wound, well, they're gonna jump ahead of you and that's the way it should be. Here's a little history, uh, just to give you a picture of how this organization got started. There was a nonprofit called do something.org. Do something.org uh, was set up to put together charitable campaigns of various types and then uh, reach out to young people who would then staff those campaigns. Things like uh, food drives for the local uh, food kitchens, um, clothing drives, recycling clothing, voter registration drives, all that sort of thing. This uh, organization built a pretty robust uh, texting platform. All the communication was via text to uh, the folks that came in and signed up for this service. The folks that were seeking this service, the young people were doing it, you know, hey, they, they just want to be of service 
or, and also they might maybe want to get some stuff on the resume, or even in some cases, some offenders were using it to uh, satisfy a um, service requirement in their sentencing, any number of things were happening. Uh, so uh, back in 2011, one of the staff members at dosomething.org got this uh, text message uh, from uh, a teenager who was uh, being sexually assaulted by their father. It was a rather, you know, a terribly upsetting message of saying, hey, he's, he keeps raping me and it's my dad and what do I do and are you there? And obviously this was something that freaked everybody out at dosomething.org. And after dealing with that uh, surprise and realizing, hey, we're getting a lot of messages that have nothing to do with our mission, they decided they needed to set up a new organization to address a different mission, which is providing this online texting service for folks in mental health crisis. That was the launch of the crisis text line. It took a couple of years to get the technology together, to get the platform ready. And they did a soft launch in 2013, August of 2013. Uh, that's when the first uh, text message was received uh, on the platform. It was staffed initially by a team of folks in Chicago and El Paso. They were uh, staff uh, people from dosomething.org and they kind of, you know, beta tested it for a while. And uh, then in 2015, they got to work. They got all the telecom companies to waive charges on any text messages coming through. Uh, they also got the, uh, all the telecom companies to eliminate um, any record of a text coming in to the crisis text line to maintain anonymity. anonymity. Um, and they also raised initial funds from uh, foundations, kind of a seed capital uh, fundraise to build out the platform and, and try to get the service uh, spread out a little bit. In 2016, they had proof of concept. They went out again and had a big uh, charitable raise, $24 million of foundation grants of various kinds. And th these are the name brand kind of big ticket folks uh, that you, you, know, you would expect to see getting behind this sort of thing. I don't have the list of all the names, but uh, um, you know, the, it, large, uh, large foundations for the most part. And they build out the platform and the coverage. In 2018, 2019, they went, from the, they went to Canada and the United Kingdom. And then in Ireland, uh, got started a little later than that. And then we come to April, 2020. When the pandemic started and there was a spike in volume, um, pretty substantial spike due to the distress that folks were feeling at that time, a lot of anxiety, um, depression, job loss, you name it, that led to a, a, a general rise in the volume at the text line. And then uh, moving to present day, uh, 5,770,000 Conversations completed since inception. That's a lot of text messages. As I mentioned, there's about 40 text messages piece here. Uh, so who are the texters? Um, Chris? Yeah. Uh, we have a question um, that says from Renee saying, tested 74174, are these robots? Who are robots? Oh, when you first text in, you get an automated response. That's right. And then they say, uh, the, the automated response says, welcome to the uh, crisis text line. Um, what's your crisis? Uh, and you can say something or not say something. If, uh, generally people say, I'm, you know, I'm anxious or uh, whatever's going on. And then they say, thank you. We, uh, we'll, we'll have a live credit counselor, uh, crisis counselor on the line for you uh, shortly. And then you're in the queue and if the queue is not full, you'll generally hear for somebody within a minute or two. But the initial responses are indeed uh, automated system responses, but you end up with a live person um, soon. Does that handle the question? I, I think so. Stanley asks um, if um, the text line refers to a specific counselor. I think that's the answer is yes, right? No, you don't get, you don't get, you, there's a pool of crisis uh, counselors online at any time. Um, 
And uh, you'll see when I, when I do the platform demo, how it works, but basically the counselors click on a button and say, I'll help the next texter. And then the system serves up a texter for you. So you can't request a specific crisis counselor. We're anonymous, so you never know who we are. We do give a name, but many crisis counselors use a, you know, a, an alias um, to maintain their own anonymity. So, uh, so you can't, you, you, it would be a weird and uh, a very odd low probability event for you to get the same crisis counselor for two different conversations if you're texting, texting in more than once. So this is not a replacement for therapy at all. This is strictly uh, helping people who are in immediate crisis get some immediate assistance and hopefully guide them, help them get calm, and then guide them to uh, resources that they can get ongoing assistance from. And we'll talk about how that's done as well. Okay. Anything else? Um, there's another question. How do you know the demographics of the textures if the data is erased? Uh, the data is not erased. The data is maintained, uh, but there are uh, questionnaires at the end of every conversation that the textures can fill out if they choose. And also they're able to do some work, I think, on uh, area codes and what are the demographics of specific area codes and they can extrapolate from there. Um, I don't really have the specifics, specifics as to how they come up with the percentage, percentages I'm about to present to you, but, uh, but they are uh, done via data mining. Um, but nobody is individually identified as being part of any particular group. There's no name data uh, associated with it, no identifiers. So the, here's the information as who the textures are. Most of them are you know, young. 75% are under 25, 50 or 100, 50% under 18. And the thing that startles me is a good chunk are under 13 years old. Uh, I've had textures age of nine uh, on, on conversations with me. It's fairly diverse, 12% African-American. That's about the same percentage as African-Americans represent in the US population. 19% Hispanic and 6% Native American. There's only you know, only 1.5% of American citizens have Native American heritage. So we're overrepresented in the Native community. And 44% of the folks that text in identify as LBGTQ+. Um, it's not surprising, I guess, because that is a group that's under uh, more stress than others, uh, for sure. And generally the texters, uh, the, uh, the folks that we serve are, are underserved. They, uh, they haven't had a lot of mental health intervention yet. 55% have never talked to anyone about the crisis they're experiencing. 68% uh, say something that they share something that they never shared with anyone else. So textures from rural areas are disproportionately represented. And 20% uh, of the textures come from the poorest counties in the United States. And I think that they figure that out via area code information. Okay, and who's on the other side of the text conversations? Uh, there's really three levels of uh, review and interaction that the texters receive on the text line. First of all is the algorithm. Uh, that's uh, not a human being. That's the robot, if you will. They are, the, the algorithm figures out severity. You know, who is really in trouble here and who needs to be treated as an imminent risk. And uh, imminent risk texters have an orange bar at the top of their text box when it comes in. And the orange bar people go to the top of the queue. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, keywords include things like Tylenol and Bridge, and there's several others uh, that, are, that are popping out of the algorithm. Um, if you've ever uh, called a suicide hotline or you've had a loved one that calls a suicide hotline, that's strictly a, a uh, chronological model. It's first come, first serve. So somebody who might be, you know, standing on the bridge with their toes over the uh, over the edge uh, might be at the end of the line. So the crisis text line has solved that problem. Who are the crisis counselors? We are unpaid volunteers. We're all over the age of 18. 
we have to apply. You got to get recommendations. Um, I think three different recommendations from people who know you, uh, both uh, personally and, and maybe professionally. You got to go through a background check, make sure you don't have any uh, naughtiness uh, on your uh, record. And then you, once you're accepted, you go into the training program, which is, uh, I think, 34, 35 hours of training. It's uh, online. I've been through it. You know, it's not easy. Um, there's a lot of quizzes, there's a lot of role playing, um, and it weeds out a lot of folks that aren't that serious. The other thing that the crisis text line asks for people, uh, ask from people is to com uh, commit to two things, uh, commit to at least four hours a week on the platform and to complete 200 hours over the course of a year and to commit to be there for a whole year. So those are the commitments. They can't enforce that, of course, uh, but uh, that's what they ask people. And that too is another uh, screening device. People say, oh, uh, I don't know what I can commit to a whole year. And then they self-select out of the program. Right now we have about 10,000 crisis counselors. Uh, the crisis text line went into a major recruitment mode when the uh, pandemic hit. The final level of interaction and support are supervisors. You know, we're a bunch of volunteers and, uh, you know, we, we don't know, uh, we're not trained necessarily as, uh, uh, you know, we're not professionals uh, in psychology or in therapy or anything like that. But there's a, a large full-time paid staff, everybody who's on staff uh, and supervising uh, has at least a master's degree in psych or social work or some related field. And uh, the uh, supervisor to counselor ratio uh, tends to vary between five and 10 uh, crisis counselors to every supervisor. Um, when things get super busy, that uh, ratio can get out of whack. You'll get, oftentimes, I'll, I'll get a, a email in the middle of the night if I'm awake to see it saying, hey, we're, you know, we're red hot here. If you have uh, the energy and the time, sign on. And we need to have people knock down this queue a little bit. And, you know, you'll get a couple hundred crisis counselors on the, on the platform at the same time, and you may not be able to maintain that ratio when that happens. Okay, I, I don't really have a lot of detail on the data, um, but let's just talk about some, some generalities here. And uh, if you're interested in more information, there's a whole bunch of information on the Crisis Text Line website um, th that you can dig into. This is a huge uh, database. As I mentioned, it's, it's over 200 million messages at this point. Um, the text line has granted access to a scrubbed and anonymous version of this data set to a bunch of uh, both, uh, I, th I think, academic uh, researchers and government researchers. Um, in addition, and that's all the conversations, um, everything that's been uh, crunched and and data mined, uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. The, there are other sources of data, um, metadata, which is variables and content that's collected from conversations automatically. So that's uh, where the algorithm is plucking stuff out as opposed to just serving up the raw conversations to people, researchers. In addition, uh, after every conversation, a crisis counselor fills out a survey um, so that data is available. And then all the texture survey stuff and then uh, algorithm derived data regarding keywords and stuff like that. So what, what, the, what, what the, the crisis text line has pulled off here is they've assembled the, probably the largest mental health care data set in the world. Uh, and it, they've made it available to the public. There's over a dozen academic research papers that have been published on the crisis text line. There's a bunch more in progress. In addition, uh, a lot of uh, state and local governments have used the data to uh, inform some of their uh, legislative ex efforts and program design. So it's really, an, it, it goes more, it goes beyond just helping individual textures. That's the main mission, but now you're getting, you know, this sort of a 
positive feedback loop going and the information is hopefully spreading out into the universe and improving at least to some degree the services available to people who are in crisis. Uh, so how do you talk to folks when they come in in crisis? This is a probably for me personally, this has been one of the most helpful uh, things I've learned from being a crisis counselor. And the crisis, this is part of our training uh, when we become crisis text line counselors is okay, um, you work on validation. So if somebody comes in and says, uh, I'm really depressed and I don't know how I can get through this, you know, such and such has happened. You don't try to cheer them up, okay? That, that's not what you do. You validate it by saying, hey, that sounds really tough. I, no wonder you feel terrible, right? Um, even though that's, you know, my knee jerk response when I heard that is, well, won't that make them feel worse? No, it doesn't, it makes them feel hurt. So that's important. Then tentifiers. It's, I'm not sure that's a real word, but I like it anyway. Um, tentifiers soften your question, right? So if you're going to ask them if they are having suicidal thoughts, you might start out by saying, do you mind if I ask you a question that, that might be a little upsetting? Okay. Um, as opposed to just blaring in there, you, you want to get them ready and get them a chance to prepare themselves for what's coming. Uh, and that gets a, a better response from them. The, the next thing is strength identifiers. As they're telling their story, you know, anything you can find uh, to point out where they're strong. Because what you're trying to do, of course, is bring them back into themselves, into their positive traits, so they feel less out of control and terrified. So things like uh, if they're talking about a family member, they're, you know, I don't want to, uh, I'm having suicidal thoughts, but I'll never do anything about it because I, I, I just couldn't possibly do that to my sister. And so then, you know, you throw out, hey, you're an awesome sister for being concerned about her, you know, things like that. So once again, you're trying to make these folks feel recognized, make them understand that they do have resources that they haven't thought about to make them understand that they're stronger than they realize. Uh, and then they can get through whatever they're experiencing at the moment. Then empathy, empathy, empathy all the time. You, you, uh, that's listening to what people are saying and then trying to feed back to them uh, maybe in different words, what you're hearing. Um, so having specific uh, descriptors like overwhelmed, um, uh, uh, devastated, um, things like that uh, can help people realize, oh, this crisis counselor gets me. You know, that's exactly how I'm feeling. So once again, you're trying to make that connection, trying to uh, establish a rapport so you can have a meaningful conversation and bring these folks to a calmer moment. And the most important thing, don't start a question with the word why. Why is the worst, why questions are the most off-putting questions in the world, right? Nobody likes to be grilled with a bunch of why questions. So we just don't use the, that particular word. The other thing that they teach you on the crisis text line is, don't ask too many darn questions, especially don't ask a bunch of questions in a row because it starts to feel like an interrogation and people just stop responding or they, they break off the conversation. So I've taken this stuff off the platform and, and into the real world. And guess what? It works pretty good. It works pretty good with my own mentally ill loved ones. So I'm so, so grateful to have that in my toolkit now. So uh, why did I volunteer? Um, I, I, this could go on a long time and I don't want it to, but let me give you the Cliff Notes version. Uh, I have, um, let me count, one, two, three, four, five, at least five family members with various mental illnesses, um, ranging from uh, bipolar disorder with psychotic features to uh, a grandson on the autism spectrum and everything in between. Um, we had an extreme explosion uh, about uh, nine years ago now, and I found NAMI and uh, became very enamored of, of what NAMI offers. 
uh, to the public and became convinced that, you know, the biggest thing we need in our country is free mental health services somehow. I know it's not practical. I know the system doesn't accommodate that, but we definitely need a way for people to get some access to mental health services without worrying about insurance or flipping out a checkbook to cover 160 bucks an hour for a therapist. NAMI does that with all of this. All of his programs are absolutely free. Uh, and I kept thinking, well, there, are, there needs to be more of this. And then uh, as, as uh, 2020 dawned on us, um, I happened to read an article about the crisis text line, I think in the Washington Post. And then the pandemic hit and I thought, oh my God, um, people are gonna go bananas with this because it's such an incredible, difficult thing. Uh, nothing like this has happened in the living memory of, of Americans. It's been over a hundred years since we've had a crisis like this. So uh, I decided to sign up for the crisis text line at that point. The other reason that I did it is, is more is our selfish reason. Um, I figured that I would get a lot out of it. I would get some uh, uh, satisfaction. Uh, it would help my own mental health to be involved with this. Uh, it would improve my self of well, my sense of well-being in my own self-esteem by helping strangers. And that has worked out for me. Um, okay, now we're going to try to do something else that's a little weird. Um, and this will take a little time. I'm going to open up the uh, crisis text line platform. Okay, so you click on, uh, you put in your uh, code, the verification code, and this is the screen that you see. And there, you'll see there's various and sundry things uh, here, uh, training module, um, a place to ask questions. This is a community. It's sort of like, you know, the message board and all that. Uh, the network is a message board. Community is, uh, hey, let's get together and have beer, you know, that sort of thing. So you click on platform and uh, you get the little message here, you're signing in. And then you get this welcome screen. And here are your supervisors. You can see over to the right, the names and locations of these folks. And then here's a, here's the platform. Okay. And uh, we have, you can see this little, uh, this is the green box. I'm not gonna open this up and show you uh, a text message, uh, you know, a text conversation because that takes about an hour to get through. And besides that would be probably not uh, uh, kosher from an anonymity pan, uh, standpoint. So you can see this little red number means that things are getting backed up. You roll your cursor over this green dot and you can see there's 109 conversations going on and there's 111 crisis counselors on the platform. Can you see that okay? Um, there's nine supervisors and there's five conversations that are in the queue right now uh, that have been in the queue for more than five minutes. Um, and finally, there's six what they call flagged conversations. Um, that means there's six folks that are viewed as being an imminent risk of uh, being a danger to themselves or others, uh, probably more likely than anything, uh, they're suicidal and they've uh, laddered up. They've gone through the four steps of suicide, which is thoughts, uh, plan, means, and time frame. Uh, we go through that laddering up process uh, and to risk assess everybody. Every crisis, uh, every texter gets risk assessed by the crisis counselor according to that ladder up process. Um, so what else have we got on the plan? So when you click on help another texter in the, uh, I'm moving my cursor around, hopefully you can see it. Over in the uh, bottom right hand corner, you can see that my cursor's over the, over the little level seven icon, a text box pops up. It looks just like the uh, a direct message box you get on Facebook or something like that. It pops up and, uh, and you'll see what the texter has put in there, what their crisis is, how they've uh, started the conversation. And then you 
put in a, a message. Now, um, you're typing in the message, the things that you want to be sure you don't do, you, you don't want to have any typos. So you have to be very careful about what you put in there. Uh, typographic area er, uh, errors tend to cause the conversations to be terminated early, okay? The texters use all sorts of creative spelling, but the counselors, when they do it, we tend to lose people. They want to have somebody who sounds, um, you know, intelligent and, and professional on the other side, even though we also have to be able to connect with them. Okay, so let me see what else I can show you on the, on the platform here. Um, toolbox is very interesting. So you're talking to somebody and you say, well, my God, uh, they are uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, breakups. Uh, or, or let's see, look, they're having relationship issues. Let's see what we have. We type relationship, and we have to spell it correctly, Chris. Okay, what do we got? All right, somebody's going through a breakup and their, their, their heart's broken, what do we do? You go breakups and relationships, you click on that and oh, look, you got tips and you got steps and you got phrases and also you got resources. I'll show you the resources as well. So the, you see, we have a lot of uh, backup as crisis counselors. We, we're not making it up on the fly. Um, we, we, can, we can go to the, the toolbox if we're, if we're kind of screwed up or we can go directly to our uh, supervisor. My supervisor is Jeanette Ramirez. And if I have a, a, a conversation going uh, and I, I'm feeling flummoxed, I can just send a, a separate text box pops up. I can send a note to uh, Jeanette. And here I can, I, I won't send her a note, but I can show you the text box. I hit the text box. There's Jeanette's text box. I can send her a message and she'll respond, right? Um, so the toolbox is important. Then you get to the point where somebody says, oh, well, I really need to find X, Y, Z. And so you go to resources and you say, okay, well, this is a person that doesn't have any money, but they need to find a therapist. What do we do? Um, you go, okay, go to, go to this resource here, open counseling, okay? This is a website, it's a searchable directory for anybody who's looking for affordable counseling. You, you, you type in your, uh, area code and it'll pop up all the folks that are available to help you in that area code and, and what their expertise is and so forth. That's just one example. Um, another example is, okay, we were talking about breakups. Uh, and this, I use this one a lot with uh, folks that are going through a breakup, uh, surviving a relationship breakup. What's this all about? I'll even, can I do this? Well, I'm not going to, if you click on this link here, it'll take you to the, uh, the PDF that has all these strategies on how to reduce your pain from a breakup. And they're really quite good, actually. I wish I had them when I was going through all my breakups. So, uh, so that's uh, the resources are, it's very deep and everything that gets included in this list of resources has been vetted by a, com a committee of, uh, of the crisis text line uh, staff. Um, they're very careful not to put anybody in the resource group that is, uh, you know, making a buck off people. Uh, you can't, there, there's no websites here that you have to pay for. There's nothing like that. You know, some of the, when you go to a directory and you get a therapist, well, okay, maybe you have to pay the therapist, but you don't have to pay to use the directory. So, uh, so they're very careful about that. The platform won't allow uh, text uh, cr uh, crisis counselors to recommend books, for example, for two reasons. First, books generally uh, need to be purchased, although you can get some of them at your local library and many of them have to be purchased and they don't want to push people into spending money. And secondly, um, the books contain a lot of uh, specific opinions and viewpoints that may or may not be uh, sufficient, sufficiently generic uh, to avoid being criticized, right? I'm not sure I've said that in an understandable fashion. They just worry about recommending things that can be misinterpreted or misconstrued. Uh, so they just don't do it, which I think is very wise. 
Um, the other thing that you have here on the uh, platform is your profile. What's the profile tell you? Uh, I can look at the profile and say, okay, I've done three and a half hours of uh, service on the platform so far this week. I'm going to do another shift later tonight. I'm going to do another shift tomorrow. That'll get me to probably, you know, seven or eight hours for the week. Uh, I have generally been running between uh, four and 10 hours on the platform each week, probably averaging six and a half, I would say. Um, and you can also track your hours uh, per month, which is kind of helpful. You can see I'm fairly consistent. I've been 25 hours a week uh, for the past few months. If you go back into uh, 2020, you can see where the spikes were. Um, things started to get elevated and we had a big spike in October because someone put out a very popular TikTok video that promoted the crisis text line. And suddenly we were just absolutely swamped with people. And that went on for a few months. Um, my total hours on the platform, I have uh, 344 hours on the platform and my total number of uh, textures is somewhere on here. Yeah, I've had 458.5 conversations since I've been on the platform. And you say, well, how do you have half a conversation? You get half a conversation when a crisis counselor has to jump off uh, the platform in mid conversation and transfers that conversation to you, which is something I'm not especially fond of, but it does happen. So I picked up a couple of those half conversations that way. Um, when a texter fills out the questionnaire, they have a uh, area where they can make sort of general comments and if, it's, if they're positive comments, the folks at Crisis Text Line share those comments with you. So it's up here on, the, on your profile. And so you can go and scroll through it and pat yourself on the back. Also, any positive concepts, uh, comments by supervisors are posted on the platform, um, which is another place to get your strokes. Um, I would like to see the negative comments, but they just don't post those, unfortunately. I would like to know what people are mad about so I can assess what I'm doing uh, that can be improved, but uh, no soap so far. So that's the platform. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I need to tell you about it. I don't think so. Oh, I know a couple of other things. Um, you'll see that all the crisis counselors are listed over here to the uh, left. Um, and you can kind of, you know, they, everybody has a profile. You can look at their profiles. Some people have pictures on their profiles. Uh, an increasing number of people don't put pictures on their profiles now, I think, mainly for security reasons. Uh, but you can see, you know, this, this is a person from, uh, you know, Belmont, Texas, Belmont, North Carolina. So, that, you know, you have a little information on this individual. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's available. And then you have a chat function. So you can talk to people on the platform, other people on the platform. Uh, and that's another area of sort. You can get on the, you get in the chat box and say, hey, uh, I have a texter here who has this issue. How have you dealt with it? And you'll get a sort of a Greek chorus of people saying, well, I did this, I did that. And it's pretty helpful, pretty interesting. It can be a little overwhelming. And then there's also uh, the random stuff where people talk about what, you're, what they're walk, watching on TV or whatever. And uh, so this is part of the community building process here. You know, there's 10,000 crisis counselors. Some of them know each other pretty well. Uh, so that's on the platform also. Um, Chris, we have some questions about the platform. Would this be a good time to field those? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, I see them. Uh, let's see. I see a couple here. Uh, oh, the, the text line worker. All, the platform is only on a comp on a laptop computer. It doesn't really function on a phone at all. Um, I guess you could look at it on a phone, but I can't imagine trying to operate on this platform without a keyboard. Uh, I guess some people use an iPad, but I wouldn't want to do that either. Um, and someone asked, how long do the texting conversations last? It varies. Um, if you have a, an engaged texter who sticks with you, um, 
they can go from, you know, 30 to 60 minutes, uh, I would say. When I get to 45 minutes, you know, if it's not a high risk uh, texter, uh, imminent risk texter, um, you, uh, uh, you try to uh, ease them towards the exit. Uh, I see someone said, if you're in over your head, can you pass the call to a supervisor? The only time you pass a call to a supervisor uh, is when there's an active rescue. Um, an active rescue occurs when you've leveled up uh, to the point where, you know, let's say you got somebody comes in and says, I want to kill myself. You say, okay, sounds like you're having suicidal thoughts. They confirm that. You say, do you have a plan? They say, yes, I'm, I do have a plan. I'm going to shoot myself. And you say, okay, uh, do you have what you need to complete your plan? And they say, yep, I've got a gun in my hand right now. I'm sitting in my car with it. And you say, okay, do you have a time frame for doing that? And they say, I'm going to shoot myself in the head in the next 60 minutes. At that point, you flag your uh, supervisor and they review the conversation and say, yep, we're going to have to uh, call in an active rescue here, try to keep this guy from killing themselves. And so you may, they may say, keep them engaged or they may take over the conversation at that point. Um, it depends on, on uh, how busy they are uh, and how many uh, other um, imminent risk uh, conversations are in progress uh, or rescue situations are in progress on the platform. Um, if you have a situation where you just don't know what to do, uh, you can get advice from your supervisor at any time, but they won't take over the conversation. They may look over your shoulder and suggest messages. Uh, that's happened to me on many occasions, but they don't take it over. They, you stay on the case. As I hope that answers your question. Do you have any other open questions here? Let's see. It's from uh, Stanley. Um, keeping consistent and uniform consist, uh, uh, historical database. I do believe that I, I, I actually know that the crisis text line folks maintain uh, a time series kind of database and they can tell you what's happened in a they can tell you what's been happening in a particular geography over a particular course in time and then try to figure out causality. So for example, if uh, there's been a couple of suicides at the local high school, they can track the messages they're getting on the crisis text line for the area around that high school and, and um, provide data to the, the school district if the school district requests it on what the issues are uh, from the people in the area. So it's, it can be pretty specific and, and pretty dialed into a, a single geography. And yes, the, all the data can be found on crisistrends.org. Someone already mentioned that. Uh, that's, that is the website you can go to to dig around and look at the data if you have an interest. Um, and there's a question Stanley asked, how is the data used when someone calls in more than once to be some type of history? Okay. Um, once again, I think every conversation is treated as a unique uh, data, data point. Uh, I don't think that, I don't know whether they uh, try to, you know, certainly they track all the conversations by individual textures. I can look at a texter's history on the text line. I can look at previous conversations they've had um, to educate myself on what the texter's issues have been in the past. Um, also, if somebody's using the text line repeatedly, which is not what it's designed for, uh, the crisis text line supervisors will place an individual on what's called a management plan. And a management plan means that uh, the crisis counselor is free to refer to past conversations that they've had on the platform to let the texter know that, you know, hey, I'm informed of your past activity. And also the, the uh, texture is informed up front that the, you know, unless they're having uh, an imminent risk situation, their conversation is gonna be limited to 45 minutes because we don't want people to view the text line as their therapist. We, we're, not, we're not therapy, we're uh, a crisis service. That's different. Uh, let's see. Okay.
Yeah, uh, let's see. Stan says the same person calls in more than once. Absolutely. We have people that we encourage people to call back in if they're in a crisis. They, we may get them to a calm point and they sign off. And, uh, you know, two weeks later, they have another crisis. They come in, same person. Um, so that happens all the time. Uh, Renee is, uh, has a comment. I'm getting a feeling this is not a safe thing. I don't know um, what feeling you're getting, Renee, but uh, uh, this is indeed a confidential and anonymous platform. None of the information that, that is being collected and crunched is tied to any uh, personal identifiers. Um, and uh, when, when uh, third party academics or government entities uh, utilize this data, it's uh, any identifiers are scrubbed out. Names, uh, anything that could identify somebody uh, is removed. So it's completely anonymous to the individuals uh, that had the conversations. So, you know, I, I am hypersensitive to that. And if I thought that this was, this data was being misused somehow and somehow uh, people were being uh, mistreated um, or uh, the data was used in some abusive fashion or was used to, God forbid, to market shit to them, I would be off the platform in a heartbeat. To the best of my knowledge, uh, and I believe uh, I have decent knowledge here, um, this is a uh, safe place for people to bring their problems. Oh, uh, right. In the, in the event of a active rescue, I see Renee, you said meaning sending out help to my apartment um, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, when we are in an active rescue situation, um, we try to get two things to happen. First of all, we try to uh, get the texter's consent to accept uh, uh, EMT visit uh, or, or something along those lines. Um, now, a lot of localities just automatically send police officers along with the uh, emergency medical tech folks, which is a practice that I just hate um, and of course, it's very worrisome. We worry on the, on the text line, particularly when we're dealing with uh, uh, persons of color, you know, it could be a, a, a dangerous situation. Also, I, the stat that I heard, it's a terrifying stat, something like 50% of the folks that are killed by police officers uh, are folks with serious mental illnesses. So it's a very dangerous situation to mix police officers who do not have the training necessary to deal with mentally ill people with mentally ill people who can't comply uh, on demand because they're in a mental health crisis and, and they are, they're, they're engaging in behaviors that police officers find uh, confusing and therefore they, they do bad shit. Um, well, and, and uh, there are some, you know, I don't wanna paint with too broad a brush, uh, in some communities, the police have been given crisis intervention training, and some communities are doing a better job of sending um, mental health uh, trained uh, folks along with the officers and, uh, and also the way uh, people communicate with uh, emergency services can um, improve the experience that they receive when those folks um, arrive on the scene. But once again, uh, you know, it is a it is a, a pain point in the mental health world for sure. Uh, when somebody's going through a crisis, uh, sending help can sometimes be dangerous if it involves uh, uh, folks with guns coming into the into the residence. Um, okay, Christine, how are we doing on time here? We're doing, uh, we're doing fine. We're at 806. I see a few other questions in the Q&A box, so I'll read those to you. Okay, great. Go ahead. How do you look up information while reading texts? It seems too difficult to do two things at once. Well, you're right. You can't do two things at once. What you can is do, uh, and there's no such thing as multitasking. There's only rapid switching between tasks. Um, the rhythm of the text conversation provides you with gaps, right? Usually there is a, 
It's not bang, 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 like a, like a spoken conversation. There's usually a pause between messages. Sometimes that pause can be a minute. Sometimes it's, you know, three or four minutes. Uh, so you do have some space to look at historic conversations, to look at resources, to look at the toolbox, to engage in chat with uh, your fellow counselors. Um, when I first uh, heard about how this was, you know, all the various things that were on the platform, I said, I had the same reaction. How the hell do you manage that? And the answer is, well, you know, there's actually more space than you think, and you do have more time than you think uh, to scan and switch between activities. Um, so I've been able, I've been able to do it. The other thing that happens, uh, and you're trained to do once you get confident on the platform, you're trained to take two conversations at a time. Uh, there's some counselors, the guys that have been on the platform, guys and gals have been on the platform for, you know several years, they'll do three conversations uh, concurrently. You know, I, I have done two uh, and I, I do that fairly regularly. And that I think is, uh, you are complete, there is no space when you have two people um, in active conversation. So uh, you have to get a good feel for the toolbox and the resources, I think before you can manage two conversations simultaneously, because you're not going to have a lot of time to study up on those things. You're going to be busy uh, responding to people and also keeping, okay, make sure you don't send, uh, you know, the test, text regarding anxiety to the person who's, uh, you know, uh, depressed or vice versa. So you got you to gotta be alert. Right. Susan asked, is the crisis text line most helpful for the person directly experiencing the mental health crisis or their loved one who is trying to help them navigate the situation or both? Can you talk about different ways it works? Yes, uh, we do get what we call third-party conversations. Uh, third-party conversation is like a parent texting in about their kid or a sibling texting in about their brother or sister. Um, that happens uh, fairly regularly. Um, those com we risk assess those conversations as well. We check to see if it, those people have any suicidal thoughts and whether they have a plan to kill themselves. We, we, we risk assess every texter. That's one of the uh, ironclad rules of the platform. But one, we get through that pretty quickly usually with the third party folks because they're generally not suicidal um, or homicidal. The, uh, what we do with uh, third party texters is we, we generally point them towards resources fairly quickly. Those conversations tend to be shorter. We also say, hey, you know, um, can you get your loved one to text us? We can help them directly as well. So maybe you can tell them about the uh, text line and, and maybe they'll text us. Um, so we do absolutely work with uh, family members and friends of mentally ill people. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of a secondary function of the platform, I would say. We're, we're not a family support type organization. Um, that's kind of a, oh, by the way, uh, sideline for us. But we do, you know, I think sending resources to people which they can then pass on to their mentally ill loved ones or apply to their mentally, mentally, mentally ill loved ones is quite helpful. Can So um, related to that, can someone who has a loved one in crisis um, reach out to the crisis text line and ask them to contact their loved one? No, we do no, we do no outreach directly to people. They have to text us. Okay. Period. Yeah, that's that's part of it. That's a safety thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, we've covered all of the questions that I can see. Yeah, let me just scan the uh, chat here, see if I missed anything. Okay, I think we covered everything. Ah. Oh, I see here we have someone who's a crisis counselor for the Trevor Project, which is a great organization, by the way. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I... I there's, there's uh, a number of crisis counselors on the text line who also volunteer for the Trevor Project. So uh, it's, what is that, Ashima? 
Glad to see you, Ashima, and uh, thank you for your service. Um, I'm not, I think we covered everybody else. Someone asked, is it possible to speak to a live counselor instead of texting? The answer to that is no, we only do texts, 100% text. If somebody really wants to have a telephone conversation, we refer them to the uh, various hotlines that are out there. And there are, there are hotlines that are gen generalized uh, mental health hotlines, or you know, most of them are started out as suicide hotlines. And then there's some that are specific to um, particular mental illnesses. There's one for eating disorders, for example. And there's a couple of others like that. So we will refer people to that. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we have um, covered all the questions. Is yeah, I see uh, there's a Christine uh, who, at, who talked about her daughter who will not reach out anymore. Um, and this is the, will you, can somebody reach out to her via text? And uh, I've already covered that question. We don't do any outgoing text messages. Um, I would, uh, you know, if you can possibly uh, uh, provide her with information on the text line, you know, with, with all these, when we have loved ones with mental illnesses, we can present options uh, and then you sort of have to let go of the outcome. All you can do is, is open a door for them and they have to decide whether they want to walk through that door or not. Um, it's very frustrating and, and agonizing, but um, that's about all we can do, unfortunately. And so insofar as you can make her aware that this resource exists, um, I think you've done a great service to her, whether she takes advantage of it or not. Um, Let's see, somebody asked for the chat numbers for bipolar disorder. Renee, I don't have those at my fingertips, I'm afraid. So I, I have to apologize to you on that. That is, there, there, is, uh, there is the, uh, you know, NAMI actually has some resources in that regard, I believe. NAMI sponsors uh, crisis lines and, and text lines, uh, not text lines, crisis lines, phone lines. Um, and, uh, I know that Chicago has a active uh, hotline service. The NAMI Chicago chapter has a hotline service and uh, many chapters around the country have warm line and hotline services. Uh, I don't think any of them operate uh, 24 hours a day, but uh, they do have, some of them have extensive availability. NAMI CCNS has a warm line. Um... And so what we do is we will get back to people within 24 hours. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Did we cover all the questions in the... Let's see. Okay. Uh, Alyssa asked a couple of questions that I don't think uh, have been addressed. One is, uh, have, have people acted on uh, their suicidal plans anyway? Um, you know, we really have no way of knowing that. And the other thing that happens on the platform frequently, which you have to get used to, is uh, you'll be in the middle of a conversation and they'll just stop, right? They'll either just stop responding uh, or they'll type stop right, which is the universal message that cuts off the texting conversation immediately. Um, and that's something that I think all texting services have to agree to in order to have permission to send messages to folks uh, the way the crisis text line does. Um, and in addition, you know, we have a, a, a protocol that we go through when somebody goes quiet. We wait for, I think, it goes six minutes, and then we send a message. We ping them, hey, we're still here. Do you still want to talk? Uh, then it goes three minutes, and you get a, a message, you know, a reminder from the platform, you know, reach out to the texter, see if they're still there. Um, you send another message, which is a little bit more pointed, which is, hey, I want to help you, but unless I hear from you soon, I'm going to have to close this conversation. And then in one minute, if they haven't gotten back to you, you give what's called a warm close, which is seems like you stepped away from your phone. 
I'm sorry, but we, can't, you know, I can't hang out anymore. Um, take good care of yourself, and you can text us again uh, if you need us. We're here 24/7, and many of those people do text back in. Um, I think that that's something else that the text line does track. And when I go into the history of individual textures, I see that there's a lot of uh, truncated conversations before they uh, get to me. Uh, so that's very common. Um, now, in terms of suicidality, the, the, the things that really have been the, the hardest for me to cope with is when somebody's laddered up, you know, they've got uh, thoughts, plan, means, time frame, and we're, we've got their and their imminent risk, and I maybe they're flagged in the system. I got my supervisor on the case, and then they go silent, and that's just like, oh shucks, you know, you, you just that hurts. Um, you want to get them to uh, a safe spot before the communication ends. So uh, sometimes when people go silent like that, that will trigger a, an active rescue um, because we're so freaked out. We figure, well, you know, the risk is high enough here that we have to do something. Um, so yeah, the other question uh, that I saw here um, from Alyssa, uh, is volunteering emotionally exhausting? Um, for me, um, I've had moments that have been, you know, hurt my heart, I would say, uh, because the, the stories are just so devastating. Um, you know, you wouldn't, it's just awful. Uh, people call like today, the, early this morning, I was on the platform and a, a woman uh, texted in who uh, was suffering from PTSD and issues herself, but she was with her boyfriend who was in a psychotic episode and who was breaking furniture and, and doing stuff. And how do we, you know, how do we get, what do I do? What do I do here? And she says, now my, and I'm, I'm having a panic attack myself, you know, because of my PTSD. So, you know, those are challenging situations, obviously. I've had people, the, the other one that just hurt my heart is a, a, a young woman texted in who was uh, cutting herself, self-harm. We get quite a bit of self-harm on the platform. Um, and, uh, and her story was her, uh, her brother had been shot in a drive-by and killed the previous day. And uh, that was one that shook me. Uh, and she, I gave me, you know, she did not stay anonymous. She gave me her first and last name and the first and last name of her brother and her location. And I was so rattled. I uh, did something that probably I wasn't supposed to do. I Googled it and I found a, a GoFundMe page for the kid's funeral. So, you know, I gave a little money, helped me, helped me sleep that night uh, to do that. But, you know, there are situations that you're going to run into that are difficult. Now, the folks, all the staff at the crisis text line, um, they're all about encouraging the counselors to engage in copious amounts of self-care. They tell you to get off the platform. They say, do not volunteer for more than 12 hours a week. It's not healthy to make this your full-time job unless you've been, you know, to school and you have a master's degree and you're ready for it. Uh, a lot of the people who are crisis counselors are people that are in recovery from mental illnesses themselves. Okay. They have great empathy. They also do have, you know, they can get triggered. That's one of the reasons why I get transfers. You know, I'll often get transfers regarding sexual assault because the counselor that got that particular texture has been a victim of sexual assault and they can't cope with it. So they send it into the, uh, the group and, and, you know, sometimes I'll end up with it. So it is um, difficult, and uh, but as uh, th the thing to remember uh, when you're a crisis counselor, uh, it's the po folks that are texting in are experiencing things that are much more emotionally exhausting than what I'm experiencing, okay? They're the folks that are truly fighting the fight and uh, you know, just to keep going is a uh, amazing act of courage 
resilience and strength. That's the truth. And that's one of the things we try to remind people. The fact that you reached out today in the middle of your terrible pain uh, shows a great deal of strength and courage. Um, and we're gonna work with you to see if we can help you find a calmer spot where you might be able to figure out some next steps. That's it. Um, that's what the crisis text line is all about. Are there any other uh, questions here that I missed? I don't see any. Nope, I don't think so. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure to talk about uh, the crisis text line with you all. Um, I hope there's been some useful information uh, that you picked up tonight. And uh, if anybody feels so moved, uh, you know, we are still looking for volunteers. You go to the website and there's a, a tab you can you can uh, apply. And uh, I've, I've managed to drag a couple of people onto the platform, some friends of mine. And, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's great service work. I will say it's great service work. And during this pandemic, it's kind of like being a frontline worker, but you don't have to leave your kitchen, okay? Um, that's one of the things, one of the things I wanted to do. I wanted to do something to help my fellow uh, citizens or my fellow human beings through this pandemic. But, you know, you can tell by looking at me that I'm in the risk, I was in the risk class here, I'm an old fart. So uh, I didn't want to go out there and catch the bug by working in the, uh, you know, food drives and stuff like that. But, you know, on my walks uh, in Evanston, going by James Park, you know, the food, they, they were handing out food there and the line got longer every week. Uh, so the distress was extreme and it still is extreme. Uh, maybe a little bit less so now, but um, uh, you can do frontline work without putting yourself at risk of infection. Uh, so that's pretty, that's pretty cool. So we're, we're coming upon the time when we would uh, close the, the webinar for tonight. I want to thank you, Chris, for um, this wonderful discussion about the crisis text lines. Certainly, it's a, an extraordinarily valuable resource for so many people. Um, and we appreciate your expertise and experience working on the front line of mental health crisis epidemic here. So thank you. Um, also for our guests tonight, I wanna just say that the pandemic has left an indelible imprint on our lives for all of us. And it's something that we'll learn to live with long after COVID is behind us. This is gonna be something that lingers um, in our lives. So I posted the national suicide prevention number in the chat box. I would encourage you to copy it into your phones or on a notepad. You never know when you might use it. Um, and so mental, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. I want everyone to know that. And we are planning a lineup of some more interesting speakers for you. As you may know, NAMI works to eliminate stigma by shining light on the lived experience of a mental health disorder. So we have invited some of our regular speakers to join us um, throughout May to share their personal stories on how they live well in recovery. Our NAMI in our own voice speakers will join us on May 12th and also on May 26th. On May 19, we will have a panel um, with an educator, a parent, a couple students, a psychologist to discuss resilience and how we can support youth during these difficult times. Um, you will find information about our upcoming programs and events on our website, which is www.namiccns.org. And I'd like to also invite you to join us on May 20 for our virtual gala. Lighting the Way, it will be full of fun and inspiration. And you can register for that event on our website also. So we are glad you could spend part of your night with us and look forward to seeing you again. Um, until then, stay safe, take care of yourselves and each other.